based on the seven letters that we received in the second and third chapters of the Revelation of John. Today we will reflect on Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. But first, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the Word of God. Let us pray. God, as you sent an angel to the Apostle John, we ask that the Holy Spirit brings the message of John through Jesus to us, and that we may see things that are, and that we may be illuminated by which is in John's testimony of trial and tribulation of the kingdom and in our perseverance as followers of Jesus, the first and the last. And now, may the words from my mouth and the meditation in our hearts be guided by the Holy Spirit and listen as I read the Word of God. And now, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life, say this, I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. The slander by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and that you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The one who has an ear, let him hear the Spirit, says to the churches, the one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever known those type of people that are just so encouraging and overwhelming with joy? Have you known anybody like that? Maybe a father, a mother, a spouse, a mentor? My wife knows someone like that. That's me. <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> not really. I had a mentor once, a mentor back in college. His name was Laszlo. I went to design school. And in design school, Laszlo was the chair of the department. Now, I have to describe Laszlo briefly to you. At the point when I met Laszlo, he was in his mid-70s. A gentleman that kind of was five foot five, bald, big handlebar mustache. The little tiny, tiny round glasses. And he walked over as a hunch with a cane. And he came into the classrooms. He was the chair, as I said, of the department. So we all revered him. He had a lot of knowledge, a lot of background. He was an immigrant here to the United States after World War II and worked his way up through design, working for big companies and doing package design and doing a lot of things with Helena Rubinstein fragrances and designing beautiful things. He had a spirit, as I said about him, that was 
just so joyous to be around him. One of the things he did was he actually drew cartoons for the New Yorker. And it was like the joy just lifted up off the pages when you saw these cartoons. He was one of these people who he just seemed to live for every day that he got up. So much encouragement he gave so many students. And I was one of them. One day I was in class and I was hunched over myself over the drawing boards doing some graphic design. And as I leaned over, my cross fell out and just dangled there over the board. Laszlo, who by this time we had become very well acquainted, he shuffled over to me, stood beside the board, and looked at me in his Austrian, ac Hungarian accent, said, ah, Meshugana. He called me, he called me, he knew my last name was Frazy, so it was crazy. He used to go, hey, crazy, crazy. <laughs> my Meshuggah oil. It means Gentile, right? My crazy Gentile. <laughs> why do you, why do you there, that cross? Tell me. And you know, I don't know what it was. Maybe my lack of maturity, of my faith maturity. Maybe, maybe there was some feeling of embarrassment. There were other folks around. Maybe because I knew that he was Jewish. And I didn't want to make trouble. You know how, you know the saying, right? We don't talk about what? Politics, religion, and I, I, don't, I don't remember the other one. But money. Money, money right. Money. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> the PG sermon. So I, I, I hesitated. I hesitated. He used to wear a flower in his lapel. I remember I told you he, he had a hard time walking. He had Parkinson's. He lived up on Fifth Avenue. Every day he would walk almost four miles to school and back. And he would pick up a flower and put it into his lapel. And if it wasn't in his lapel, it would be on his, in a Dixie cup on his desk. But back to what, when he asked me the question, why do you wear that cross? I hesitated and he said, and I said, I, I just flippantly said, well, because I'm Christian, Laszlo. And he started to shuffle away and he said, ah, do you know why I wear this flower? I said, no, tell me. He said, well, I'll tell you what. The day you tell me why you really wear that cross, I'll tell you why I wear this flower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Church of Smyrna the second in our second letter that we're reviewing today, looking at, the Church of Smyrna had no problem telling why they believed in Christ. The letter that came from John was a one of the only of the seven, or excuse me, that through Jesus that came from John was one of only seven letters that was a letter of complete encouragement to a community that was filled with devout Christians, this underground church that in the face of sure death of all of the Romans and of the Jews that were persecuting these Christians, these Christians stood fast. They had rich faith, a deep faith in Christ. Smyrna, which is located on the Aegean Sea at the time where Turkey is today, it's called Izmir today, was one of the glorious crowns 
of Asia Minor, and that's specifically of the seven cities that we're looking at in Revelation. It was a city that was held up by the Romans. It was the most paganistic city. And to be a Christian was, to say the least, extremely difficult. But Jesus wrote these words to encourage the people to be, to persevere, to persevere in light of this persecution. One of the interesting things about, as I dove into learning more about the Church of Smyrna, was as I say, the where it was located, the city, was a beautiful place for a port where exports would happen. That's why it was one of the wealthiest cities. And one of the things that they exported most was a flower called myrrh, hence Smyrna. And it was very expensive. But the thing that is interesting, symbolically speaking, is that when you crushed this flower, an aroma came from it that was sweet. An unbelievable sweet smell when crushed. <coughs> Makes you think, right? How, how symbolic is this in a city where people, Christians, are being crushed underneath such persecution, yet the aroma of the gospel was evident. And they stood fast in their beliefs. They persevered in their beliefs. The word perseverance may not be what we think today in the sense of, you know, we see in sports or in business to stick with it and you'll be wealthy, to keep trying. The word, if you take a moment, look back to the Hebrew word of it, is quite interesting. And it's a little bit different than what we would normally think it would mean. It is a word that describes more about the essence of perseverance. It is, for all intents and purposes, more than just to succeed. It is hat madah, hat madah, which means this metaphorical or spiritual idea of courage and endurance. It's a derivative from tazmid, meaning everlasting. Scripture tells us that blessed is a man who pers perseveres, or in other words, has faith under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to all that love him. The church of Smyrna persevered. The church of Smyrna, under trial and tribulation of extreme proportions because of their faith in Jesus, had perseverance. There's something in that symbolism I think we can take away. Isn't there? The idea, as I mentioned about myrrh and being crushed, that we can, we can be crushed, can't we? We can be crushed in our spirit. But the amazing grace of God, the sweet sound of the gospel comes through, doesn't it? it comes through and infuses us to persevere.
So you may be thinking back and saying, so why did Laszlo wear that flower? So over time, as I said, we became very close. We had many dinners together. One time he and his wife invited me up to their apartment. Now I had been thinking about this, an answer to the question he posed, and I wanted to find out why he wore this flower. As it turns out, as I had mentioned, he was an immigrant. He was a Holocaust survivor. And without getting into a long story, which is absolutely amazing, let me just tell you a brief to make the point. This man had so much joy and perseverance, I've never seen it like anything before. When he was 13, he lived in Austria. He came home from school one day, it's 1937, to find his father hanging in the front yard. His mother and sister murdered in the house. In a very wealthy neighborhood, his father was a doctor. He went in the house and picked up a bag, a small little bag, threw some things in it, and left for good. He was captured three times by the Nazis. He escaped twice, two prison camps within five years. He made it to South America, was captured and sent back to Poland. One particular time, he was this last third time, he was in his cell, a cell no more than six feet by six feet. 12 to 13 people in with him. In the courtyard, executions happened. Every morning, they knew that they would take the straw to execute. They would not waste bullets on the weak. One day, he on the cell doors, a young man who he grew up with, a German guard, brought him a Bible. He knew him, small pocket Bible. Laszlo read that Bible for several days. He, and one time he was allowed to leave for a work detail, he picked up a flower in the yard and he brought it in. And he knew that by the end of the three or four days that that would wither, his time was probably up. He read through the Bible, the Old Testament, the Gospel, as he said to me. And he put the flower in there, a small little Bible like this. The next morning, on the 10th day, he opened it up. At dawn, the flower was withered. and he heard bombers in the air. The Royal Air Force, the Royal English Air Force, British Air Force was overhead, dropping bombs. It destroyed the camp. Everybody scurried and he escaped. He ran for the tree line, hearing gunfire behind him, he escaped. So why did he wear that flower as he sat and told me that one evening? He said, you know, John, I don't know if your Jesus saved the entire world, but he saved me. He saved me as he took his little Bible and opened it up. And still could smell the sweetness of the gospel. And he closed it. My friends, the sweetness of the gospel 
the people of Smyrna. They had unbelievable faith. <coughs> unbelievable faith in light of persecution. Even though they had no reason to have that faith, except for the fact that he was the first and the last and gave hope, gave perseverance as he gives to us. He gives us perseverance of faith. He gives us, he gives us perseverance. If I was to see or have the fortunate opportunity to see Laszlo today, I'd have an answer for him. Unlike the days that I didn't have an answer for him. I'd tell him about the first and the last. I'd tell him that Jesus is the sovereign over human history and that Jesus will always be in control. I would tell him that Jesus is has died and come back. I would tell him that if you are faced with death, how encouraging is it to know? How encouraging is it to know that you will have life again? In closing, We all can learn about being crushed and having this hakmada, this perseverance, this courage and endurance beyond all belief. I wish that for the world. I wish that for every one of us here. And I'm more steadfast in that today than ever before. Amen. Amen. And now, if you are able, please stand as we sing together in praise. place today, let us remember 
about perseverance. And now, unto him that reveals his kingdom of life everlasting as made possible to us through the grace of the Father through the Son, may the Holy Spirit fill our lives with courage, endurance, and perseverance. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.